Good morning, everyone. I'm Felipe Saldanha from the Carlos Rubenkan Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us, those here in the room and everyone watching us online. For those who don't know, the Carlos Rubenkan Foundation is a Portuguese private institution that works hard to contribute to a fair and sustainable society, and we do it through four statutory areas, art, charity, science, and education. Today, I will have the honor to host the award ceremony of the second edition of the Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity, a one million euro international prize entirely dedicated to tackling the climate crisis. During the event, we'll have the opportunity to dive into the winner of this year's prize and to have different conversations with key people involved or impacted by this initiative. So to start, we'll show a short video of the Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity. capable of changing sea levels. We can reverse the weather, raise the planet's temperature, reshape the landscape, erase thousands of species from the Earth's surface. We can also connect people across the globe, go to great lengths to save the tiniest beings, Venture boldly into the unknown. Create new types of intelligence. And conquer the mystery of life. The Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity rewards people or organizations whose work mitigates the impact of climate change and empowers society for the future. This means a lot to me and I hope that it will, that it will help me do more good in the world. There is no limit to our power. Apply it on humanity. Apply for humanity. This video shows us how impactful our human activities on climate change, but it also reminds us about our capability of doing more good in the world. We can decide if you want to impact our planet and our future in a negative or positive way. As Sir David Attenborough referred in the beginning of this COP, people are the greatest problem solvers to have ever existed on Earth. And I believe this is a good excuse to call on stage. The president of the Carlos Rubenkan Foundation, Isabel Mota, will open the floor with some good problem solving examples. So please, you can stay here or here or whatever you want. And I will change to that. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Dear Vice President of uh, the European Commission, um, responsible for uh, the Green Deal, uh, I think is the most uh, uh, appropriate uh, um, way to call, <laughs> uh, to call him. And also, uh, dear um, Michelle Bloomberg, that is uh, looking at us, uh, is following, following us by streaming. So these are both the Vice President, President uh, Timmermans and uh, uh, Michelle Bloomberg. Uh, that is uh, the United Nations um, uh, Special uh, Envoy for Climate. Both are co-founders, co-chairs, co-chairs of Global Covenant of Mayors. Senhor Ministro de Portugal, Ministro do Ambiente uh, e de Climate Action uh, of Portugal, uh, é para nós um, um grande, uma grande honra uh, a sua presença e uh, é um grande incentivo também uh, para uh, a Fundação Gulbenkian uh, a sua presença aqui entre nós. Um, dear Ambassador of the, the Global Covenant, Greg Hobertenson, and Government of uh, um, Kisumu County, Professor Peter Neongo, dear coll colleague of the, <coughs> of the board, Martin Pessayan, 
distinguished members and uh, of the jury and guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be, to be here today to award the second edition of the Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity, Climate Change, to the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the largest global alliance of cities committed to fight the climate crisis, which is co-chaired, as I have already said, by uh, Mr. Timmermans and Mr. Michael Bloomberg. Allow me first to thank the United Nations and the, the European Commission, which together made it possible for the Caldus Gulbenkian Foundation to organize such an important event during COP26, where discussions and commitment will shape the future of our humanity. This summit, summit is not only the most important climate <coughs> event in the world, it is one of the most important diplomatic meetings in history where we should all be focused on contributions and concrete actions to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions, protect our ocean and land, ensure climate justice, and increase financing commitments. And uh, we all have a role to play. Carlos School Bank and Foundation wants to be <coughs> a proactive player towards sustainable development. In 2019, we have divested from fossil fuels and start um, reallocated our funds in assets with a positive impact on society. Today, we have an investment strategy aligned with env environmental, social and governance criteria. Sustainability is also a core value for philanthropic purposes, mainly to the respond to the state of emergency in which the planet and humanity finds itself. The, <coughs> the foundation is dedicated to support work across climate and uh, ocean protection in Portugal, in the UK, where my colleague is in charge, and internationally, together with major partners with whom we share this mission, such as Ocean Azul Foundation and Suárez uh, Santos Foundation, uh, and uh, that are here present Dr. José Soares Santos. The Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity, humanity created uh, in uh, uh, exactly in the same uh, data when we divest from the, the, the fossil, fossil um, investment, investments. Um, is the Calus Gulbenkian Foundation committed contribution to help outstanding people and organizations to accelerate the mitigation of the climate change and promote a society that is more resilient to climate impacts while protecting the most vulnerable. In this second edition, we recognize the unique work of Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy in supporting mayors all over the world <coughs> leading the transition of cities to low carbon and climate resilient communities. This is a distinctive e example of the enormous positive impact that local and collective, collective action may have on a global, in a global scale. As we all know, an example is very much aligned with the desired process and outcomes of COP26. Let me also <coughs> highlight two facts. Cities 
represents only 2% of the territory worldwide, but they are responsible for more than 70% of greenhouse gas, of of gas emissions and 90% of urban areas are in co coastal zones, particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events. This means our races to zero and to resilience requires profound transformations towards a urban planning and management all over the world as the climate impacts and finance capacity are very much asymmet uh, asymmetric, asym asymmetrical between the global north and the south, the global, global government will use the prize <coughs> fund to support the energy transition and climate res resilience in, um, resilience in Sub-Saharan Africa, namely in Senegal and Cameroon. Today, we will have the privilege to hear more about our winner and about the nature of the projects to be supported by the prize. In the end, we will have the opportuni opportunity to hear from three members of our distinguished jury. But last but not the least, I am very happy to announce the call for nominations for the third e um, edition of the Gulban Prize of Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity will be open next Monday, uh, November 15. Thank you very much for joining us and hope our messages will be of use and impact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your warm welcome and inspiring speech. Uh, it is nef definitely not easy to summarize the extended work of the Global co Covenant of Mayors across 11,000 cities, but the video we are about to watch uh, will show us the transformational impact of, of this alliance in our future. Please note that the voiceover of this video was gently provided by a young climate leader from Ghana, and she is Ellen Lindsay Ayuku. COVID-19 has changed the world as we know it, and mayors and cities have been on the front lines of both the pandemic and climate change. As we move forward, we have a choice to make. We can return to fossil fuel-powered economies, polluted air, and crumbling infrastructure, or we can transform our economy and build a better foundation for the future by creating cleaner, healthier, and more resilient communities. That is a green recovery, and it must begin in cities. An investment in low carbon infrastructure, an investment in millions of new jobs, an investment that serves and protects people, all while confronting the climate crisis. From Paris to Pittsburgh, Accra to Adelaide, Hundreds of mayors and cities in dozens of countries have committed to halving emissions by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2050. Because cities are home to over half of humanity and produce 80% of global GDP, they are the key first step in the green recovery, able to deliver nearly half of the emission reductions needed to keep global heating well below 2 degrees centigrade. But City leaders can do more when working together with partners. Cities continue to need partnerships and support from national governments as well as engagement with communities to deliver green recovery actions that address the COVID-19 and climate crisis together. 
to scale solutions globally. More than 10,000 mayors have committed to the global covenant of mayors for climate and energy and stand ready to partner with local and national leaders to kickstart an inclusive green recovery and net zero future. Join us. Okay, to, to celebrate this award, I will now ask Isabel Mota, the president of the Carlos Kubinkan Foundation, and Martin Sia, trustee of the Carlos Kubinkan Foundation, to proceed with the, the awards celebration to the awardees representatives, Mr. Franz Timmermans, executive vice president of the European Commission. Yes, and also to Greg Robertson, the global ambassador of the Global Covenant of Mayors, here representing Michael Bloomberg and uh, co chair of the Global Covenant of Mayors. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we need a picture of the medal. The, the, the four of you standing, oh, right. because it's, it's okay. the Global Covenant, it's co share yeah, so <laughs> just one. We are all smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> So I believe everyone would love to hear our our D. So I will, Mr. Franz Timmermans, I would may I invite you to say some words? Um, absolutely. I, I am so grateful to the Goldberg Foundation for recognizing the role of mayors. Mayors are the ones who are going to decide with their citizens whether this transition to a sustainable world is going to be successful, yes or no. They are close to their citizens, they know what is needed in their cities, they are trusted by their citizens, and they can deliver. Uh, so in recognizing their role, the Gubekian Foundation sets an important step in empowering mayors across the world to be able to play this role to the fullest. So thank you, thank you very much. And we thank you also for an example of leadership. Um, we'll now hear Mr. Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg video statement. M Mr. Michael Bloomberg was not able to join us today on site, so he sent us a, a video statement. It's not this one. It's not this one. This is the next one. Hello. On behalf of the Global Covenant of Mayors, I want yeah. to thank everyone at the foundation for this award, which we're honored to receive, and for all you do to drive progress on climate change. I also want to thank the European Commission and our co-chair, Franz Timmermans, for his leadership and partnership. Cities are the key to winning the battle against climate change. They are taking action, and by supporting them and helping them work together, we can do a lot to speed up global progress. That's what we're doing through our partnership with the European Commission on the Global Covenant of Mayors. And the fact is, the pandemic has made the work cities are doing even more important and urgent. The funds that come with this prize will go towards our group's work in sub-Saharan Africa, which is home to some of the world's fastest growing cities. It will help protect them from the impacts of climate change in ways that also help them bounce back from the economic impacts of the pandemic. So this prize will make a big difference in a lot of lives. Thanks again, and all the best. Okay. 
So the Global Covenant of Mayors is using the price to support two large investment red, ready green infrastructures in two countries in sub-Saharan Africa. One of those projects will be implemented in five cities in Senegal uh, to improve the supply of drinking water. So let's see the project, the, the first project now, please. The contribution of the foundation is very important in the sense that it is going to be targeting social points of water where otherwise the communities would not have access to clean water. Concernant le problème d'eau, il y a des problèmes vraiment très 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 difficiles. Les femmes portent des, des bassins. Et aller même la commune pour aller vers les autres communes pour chercher de l'eau. Mais depuis leur vote départ jusqu'à présent maintenant, en tout cas les robinets coulent à flot. The project that the European Investment Bank is implementing together with La Sones here in Senegal is very important because what we are doing is providing clean water to the communities and the municipalities and through this we are achieving improvements in public health also the, the question of waterborne diseases and making more time available for women in the domestic environment so they don't have to spend so much time going to collect water. Thank you. So we'll now begin our first panel, and you already have with us also Professor Peter Anyong Nyong, Governor of Kisumi County. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Franz Timmermans, and we would like to love to hear from you. It's how the European Union's support to the Global Covenant of Mayors is connected to the European Union's increased climate ambition uh, overall. And I hope you will indulge me just one minute to say why it is so important that a foundation located in Portugal is part of this. Uh, I have been um, a fellow traveler of Portugal's history for the best of 50 years. I remember when Portugal emerged from dictatorship. Mm -hmm. I was a young diplomat when Portugal became member of the European Union. And if you look back at the last couple of years, a country with both feet in Europe, with its um, uh, looks, it looks over the ocean to the rest of the world. Its heart is in Africa. It combines all these elements into its policies. It's extremely successful mm -hmm. in combating uh, the COVID pandemic. It's extremely successful in making a transition to renewable energy. It is extremely successful in investing in the right things in this recovery. I mean, Portugal is, is really an example to, to all of us. And I think this needs to be said. Uh, it, it needs to be said because it, 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 it links into uh, the prize being awarded uh, to the Global Covenant of Mayors because in Portugal the experience is that you need to have support from people locally to make this transition. It is not by accident that Portugal is arguably the highest, has arguably the highest percentage of vaccinations uh, uh, in Europe. I'm not sure if it's the highest, but it's among the highest in Europe because people believe in each other and, and have shown solidarity amongst each other. And this is exactly what we need to achieve on a global scale. So this example can help us empower mayors to show to their citizens that this transition is possible. But it also gives the European Union, and I would say the, the industrialized world, the opportunity to show very materially solidarity with the developing world in, in showing that these, this tremendous effort to adapt to what is already uh, the climate crisis, to the consequences we're all facing, that in this adaptation, the global south is not left alone. And that we demonstrate clearly, 
our commitment in funds, but also in technical assistance, in working on projects together, in sharing experiences, um, uh, in greening cities, in providing uh, 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 public transport that is zero emission in cities, in looking for solutions in waste management in cities. All these things that we're all working on uh, at a global scale should be shared uh, with uh, mayors and cities that will s simply have a bigger challenge because they don't have the funds that other cities have. So I believe that is the importance of, uh, s uh, of awarding the award to the Global Covenant of Mayors. It creates real solidarity, material solidarity, not just in words, but in facts and in finances that will help us overcome this crisis. And you know, we can overcome this. We can adapt uh, to the climate crisis. We can uh, still stay on the 1.5 degrees, but only, only if we leave no one behind. And if we demonstrate to all our citizens that they're part of the solution and they will not be left on the side of the road in this transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we jump for a specific example. And Professor Peter Nyong, I will ask you, how being part of the Sub-Saharan African Covenant of Mayors helped the county of uh, Kisumu in your climate action journey? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Let me first, perhaps, first, uh, let me first uh, introduce myself. Uh, I come from a city called Kisumu, somewhere in the west of Kenya on the tip of Lake Victoria. Uh, Lake Victoria is one of the biggest freshwater lakes in the world, the second freshwater lake in the world. Um, and my city is just a few kilometers from the equator. Now, <coughs> Kisumu is not very old as a city. Uh, it became a city um, about 20 years ago. But before then, it was a very important place of commerce and trade, uh, getting people to trade from all over the place. It was the center of commerce and trade. So it was used to a lot of people gathering together and living. Now, this reminds me of a comment that Governor Stephen Bullock, former governor of Montana, made in Santa Fe uh, when we attended as governors from Kenya the American Association of Governors. And he said one of the things he enjoyed being a governor is really learned that everybody everywhere in the world lives somewhere local, a place you call home. And therefore, the thing that is important to everybody in this world is local government. Be they mayors or governors are we are. Kenya, Kenya got rid of governors some time ago, and we have city manager and then governors over them. Now, so this idea that we live at a local place somewhere makes climate change very important to us. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, what we, d what we experienced a couple of uh, months ago when there was uh, f huge rains in Kenya, when the river over the lake rose, rose, so many businesses were destroyed, so many homes were destroyed, primary schools, people had been removed from where they live to higher area. They lost property, they lost livelihood, and this was extremely expensive, both for the county and the national government to do something about. Uh, what is the moral of this thing, this story? That we need to prevent such disasters rather than wait until they happen. Now, the United Cities and local governments of Africa, which is the equivalent of the co covenant of mayors, which we belong to, is going to hold a summit in Kisumu in May next year called AfriCity Summit. And the subject matter of that summit is the intermediary cities of Africa, the metropolis of the future. In intermediary cities of about half a million, 200,000 people are going to the biggest cities in Africa in the next 30 years. If we don't plan them differently, and avoid the mistakes we have made so that when global warming comes, we are, take, we are taken uh, by surprise and we, we live with destruction among our meats, then we shall just be penny-wise and pounds foolish. Mm -hmm. We'd rather spend the money now, plan well, have urban habitation where the use of the urban space 
reflect, reflect the necessity of concrete construction mm -hmm. and the necessity for the green space. Then we have a balance that human beings can live in a city that is hab habitable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I invite you to Kisumu in May next year, all of you. Thank you very much. Come and join us on uh, the intermediate cities in Africa, the metropolis of the world. And let's get all your ideas to see how these cities are going to be planned today mm -hmm. to avoid the disasters of global warming. Now, global warming is going to be with us whether we reduce it 1.5% or not. So yes. let us live with that reality. I don't want another situation in this world where we have been talking sometimes of the new international economic order, water for all by year 2000, and all this happens, we don't have water for all by year 2000. Yeah. What we are saying today, are they going to be mean, meaningful in the next 30 years? Yes. Let's do something that makes a difference to our children, our children's children, <laughs> when we're all gone, when the habitable city mm -hmm. will be there, whether in Africa, or Latin America, mm -hmm. or in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we will definitely save the date for May 2022. Uh, Martin S.A.N., trustee of the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation. At the UK branch of the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation, we have placed a strong emphasis on community engagement through local authorities as well as national governments. Uh, what drove this strategy and what have you done so far? If you can do it, do, say it in a nutshell, because yeah. we have behind yeah, schedule. Sure, <laughs> sure. sure. Uh, I mean, obviously, all the reasons that my fellow panelists have given about the importance of cities. But for us, there were two quite personal things. The first was our experience on previous work where we were trying, we funded a campaign to end loneliness. And we got messages like loneliness is as dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes a day in the manifestos of all three of the main parties in the UK. But the time when it really got traction was when we targeted the local authorities. And it snowballed. And eventually, we ended up with 80% of all of the local authorities, the health and well-being boards, putting together a plan to end loneliness in their area. And that is what really delivered it. So we were very struck by that. And the second thing was there was an alignment between local authorities and what we wanted to do. We wanted to do public engagement, and we wanted to do it based on people's values. Because the research we'd done on climate and previously on ocean was that if you appeal to people's values and go to where they are, rather than just banging them over the head with the science, you have a much better chance, particularly if you're reaching out to the unconverted. And there's always a risk of our preaching to the converted rather than reaching out. And those values are often local values. And it is, as you said, much better to address them locally. I mean, an instance in this country is there is what's known as the Blue Wall, who are the voters who switched to this government to support them and are vital to supporting the government. They're traditionally seen as not being friendly towards the climate and whatever. But our research shows that if you appeal to their values, their desire to preserve nature, which is often local nature, their interest in their children and their grandchildren, and then lastly, their concern to avoid waste. These are all fundamental values that they've got and we can address. And then I guess briefly just to address the second part of your question, which is around um, what have we discovered so far? And I guess really three things. The first is we funded people on local authorities uh, to work out what is going to work. So we funded a number of organizations to work with local authorities to understand what is going to work. And we'll be publishing that next year. The second is around working with organizations more generally on public engagement. And at this COP, we've got seven organizations who are, have agreed a common evaluation framework so that we can look on common measures at what works and what doesn't work. And the last is particularly about your references to the Global South. Our founder was determined that his foundation should benefit all of humanity. Now, naturally, the climate does that. If you're doing mitigation, you're benefiting the whole world. But we wanted to do more than that. And we funded the Citizens' Assembly, the Global Citizens' Assembly, to bring representatives from around the world to this conference so that their voices can be heard here 
and we understand what the people who are really facing the difficulties um, think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Isabel Mota, the, the, the last que question, it's related to the previous one, but in a more a broader term. Uh, in your opinion, uh, uh, as a president of, of a, a big foundation, what is the role of civil society, and in particular foundation, in fighting the climate crisis? Thank you. Well, my colleague has already said a lot, uh, but uh, I think that uh, foundations as uh, characteristics that are uh, very helpful in what concerns to deal with this kind of problems. First of all, are independent. Uh, second, we don't need to be worried with the, the um, cycles of uh, political uh, cycles. So we have uh, um, a position uh, uh, focused on the long term. And uh, third, well, <coughs> you have some uh, means, funds, in order to, uh, to, to help uh, uh, different actions. Um, there are also some things that uh, Martin has already referred that I think is very important. In our case, we also have an institute of uh, science, and so we also uh, can uh, provide science supporting the decisions of the policies. Uh, second, um, we also uh, make, uh, um, uh, we, um, uh, we implement uh, innovative solutions for the several uh, projects, and this is something that the foundation can do better than any other institution, is to risk, to have risk, and, uh, and some, some of them have has really a big impact. Third, um, we are able to make uh, partnerships with other foundations that has the same values and same procedures that we have. And this gives more um, capacity to our action. And finally, what I think is very important, what Martin has already said, is we, we are near the people uh, in the communities. And in our case in Africa also, because we have a long program, uh, a long, a big program uh, of, uh, in Africa for different areas. And this, uh, uh, this possibility to be with the community, communities, to understand them, gives us a uh, surplus, let us say, to make advocacy, what is very important. And the last thing I, say, uh, I think is very important is the, uh, the, cap the capacity, as Martin said, <coughs> to uh, give awareness, awareness to, the, uh, to the society, to the public opinion about this kind of, of uh, uh, issues. Okay. is very, very important that uh, all of us, everybody, ev every cit uh, citizen understands that uh, there is something also that uh, uh, has to do with us, mm -hmm. with uh, each one. Okay. And this is something that foundations can uh, really uh, may, uh, may have a role. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your contributions. We'll have to finish now. Uh, and I ask a big round of applause for our extraordinary speakers. Thank you for coming. Yeah, the video, but they have to... to oh, okay, okay. So the, the second project, we already talked about the Senegal project. The second project supported by the Global Covenant of Mayors with the Gulbenkian Prize uh, will be in Garua, Cameroon, to support the development of ener energy public lighting solutions. So the mayor of Garua, Dr. Osmaila Muhammadou, sent us a, sh a short statement about, about the importance of this support. Bonjour, je suis le docteur Ousmane Lam Mohamedou maire de la ville de Garoua au Cameroun. Euh, la ville de Garoua est signataire de la Convention des maires pour l'Afrique subsaharienne. À ce titre, elle est membre de la Convention mondiale des maires pour le climat et l'énergie, un réseau mondial de plus de 11 000 villes 
qui se sont engagés à œuvrer en faveur du climat. L'impact négatif de la crise climatique actuelle sur notre ville nous a poussé à élaborer notre plan d'action pour le climat pour mieux encadrer les efforts visant à croître notre résilience et notre capacité d'adaptation au changement climatique. En effet, les défis liés au changement climatique sont nombreux pour la ville de Garoua et ils prennent de l'ampleur chaque jour. Des périodes de sécheresse plus, plus longues, des pluies plus rares, mais très intenses qui causent des inondations et des vents violents. À côté de cela, une démographie et une urbanisation croissante avec, une, avec un besoin en énergie très élevé. Pour nos populations qui sont par ailleurs très jeunes, notre ville doit donc mettre en place des projets d'infrastructures vertes et résilientes euh, aussi rapidement que possible afin de réduire les émissions et s'adapter au changement climatique. Nous ne pouvons pas y parvenir seuls, car les ressources des collectivités locales restent un défi majeur dans de nombreux pays d'Afrique en général et du Cameroun en particulier. Je suis donc très heureux que le financement du prix Gulbenkian pour l'humanité soit utilisé pour aider Garoua et d'autres villes d'Afrique subsaharienne à aller au-delà de leurs plans et stratégies d'action climatique et à mettre en œuvre des projets durables et utiles pour leur population. Nous sommes également heureux que cet appui s'étende sur le long terme à travers une assistance technique du GECOM afin d'aider les villes à transformer leurs idées d'efficience énergétique en stratégie et en projet prêt à être financé. Nous remercions encore une fois de plus la Fondation Gulbenkian. Grâce à cet appui, nous continuerons à œuvrer pour un système d'éclairage public durable à Garoua, ce qui signifie plus d'emplois, une plus grande sécurité, des inégalités sociales et une planète saine pour nous tous et les générations à venir. OK. So now we'll have the honor to welcome three members of our jury. Agora temos a honra de dar as boas-vindas aos membros do nosso júri. Miguel Bastos Araújo é o professor de investigação e de vice-presidente do júri de prémio Gulbenkian para a Humanidade e Johan Drogstrand e Runa Khan. E Miguel, vou começar consigo. E nos últimos recentes vimos o lançamento de prémios internacionais que tem como foco projetos sustentáveis. Qual é a importância destes prémios aqui para ajudar as respostas ao clima? Consegue ouvir-me? Sim. Muito obrigado. A magnitude e ritmo das transformações necessárias para adaptar e mitigar alterações climáticas são de tal maneira que nós temos de ir todos no mesmo sentido e isto é um esforço uh, eficaz e será mais uh, depressa e, e se tivermos instituições que podem alterar este processo. And empower them to take uh, action and do good uh, in a more effective and efficient way. Good. Thank you very much. Hune, one of the main goals of the Kalus Kubenkan Foundation is the protection of the most vulnerable population groups, which is also one important mission of this prize. Um, the devastating climate impacts are a sad reality, and the majority of funds, 90, 93% of funds, uh, tackling the climate crisis focus on mitigating. So um, we, yesterday we had some, some commitments around adaptation, but in your opinion, how can institutions, as the ONG Friendship, can strengthen the adaptation responses now, not in 2030, now? <laughs> I think it's voices. I think the oh, uh, working in solidarity, everyone is needed. Last year the prize was given to Greta. Voices were needed. These voices need to be carried to the decision makers, needed. You also need the scientists to prove. And then you need people, organizations like ours, which are actually the examples. Mm -hmm. We started working with climate vulnerable communities and impacted communities 20 years ago. You know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in trying to ensure that they have a platform on which, from which they can take off. Today, seven million people annually are accessing our services directly. 
these are things which need to be brought to the platform because they wo it works because there are some fundamental things which are beyond just project building. Yeah. It is beyond, it's with soft skills, values, the way you work, ensuring that when you leave a community behind, you leave them behind with an opportunity, you leave them yeah. behind with dignity, and then you leave them behind with hope so that they can continue for their future. Yeah. And this voice needs to come directly to the decision makers. And I hope that this is what we are doing. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> that is one of the goals too. <laughs> um, Professor Joanne Rockstrom, the nexus uh, climate water is usually strongly emphasized by you. As you have seen in one of the videos, the Global Covenant of Mayors will use the Gulbenkian Awards to supply drinking water to vulnerable families in Senegal. Um, in your opinion, how important is the resilience of the water sector in tackling this climate crisis? If you look at the science, we know, uh, you know unequivocally that victim number one with regards to the impacts of global warming is, is related to fresh water. It is droughts, floods, heat waves, causing water scarcity, causing food insecurity driven by water extremes. So however we twist and turn this, the, 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 the first line of impact is always related to water extremes. And that hits on top of the, the already fundamental vulnerability related to water in many of the cities in the world. So you, you, you start off in a, in a low resilient point and you amplify extremes related to water degradation, which is, by the way, not only global warming, but it's also water quality deficiencies, lack of, of water provisioning services, which is exactly yeah. what these projects are going to be about. But I want to just, just raise the challenge even further because um, it's one thing to serve communities with uh, healthy, high quality drinking water, yeah. but we know that there's equal large challenge in securing good quality fresh water for food production. So, so we have this, uh, uh, you know, cities um, are, are fundamental in, in engaging in the entire agenda of water for human security, which is both health and food, and food being yeah. a fundamental oh, for health. So yes, I think it's a, it's a really a good target that, uh, that the Global Covenant of Mayor is taking on yeah. this prestigious prize. Good. I believe you are right on time now. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, I will ask again a big round of applause. This was a very uh, uh, quick panel, but uh, with strategic uh, questions and answers, I believe that we made the difference and we finished very well. So thank you very much for coming and for joining us. And I hope this message will amplify for the future. Um, and just a big round of applause, please. Thank you.